Okay, so all of this time we were setting up this template project. And um, what I will do here is I'm going to close the command prompt. I had the config file open inside of Notepad. I'm going to close the config file as well. And so on my flash drive, I've got a folder called apps. So I'm going to go to my flash drive. This template that we created is in the folder called apps. If you open that up, there's a template project. If you uh, right-click the template project and select copy, and then on an empty spot right-click and paste, this will make a copy of the folder and everything inside of it. And this is basically then creating a brand new project based on the template, and it's ready to go. It has the Android code, it has the browser code, it has the plugins, it has what I had written inside the config file. It's a brand new app. It's still called template because I would need to change the config file, and for the moment we won't. Um, I'm going to work with this. Um, for the moment we won't get too complex with changing this. I just want to make a copy of the project, and maybe we should have done it earlier. But um, making a copy of the project folder makes a brand new project. After this copy is over, then what we will do, well, as it's copying over, I might as well. Let's open a web browser. And let's go to uh, cordova.apache.org. We've spent all of this time setting up a taco project, aka a Cordova project, aka a phone gap project. Let's explore a little bit what features we have. All the documentation is right here, cordova.apache.org. Um, this is the parent uh, where all of the code springs from. On the top um, row, you see documentation, or in the center here, click documentation, and uh, you can read all of the um, introduction and all of that at the left, creating your first app and testing it. We did variation of this. And then specific documents for what do you need to do if you're going to develop an Android app via Taco? What are you going to need to do if you're going to develop a, an iOS app? You notice with Cordova, with Taco, we can create Android apps, iOS apps, OS 10 apps, Windows, Windows 8, even Ubuntu apps and Blackberry apps. So we can create all of these kinds of apps for these platforms. A lot of information for you to read on your own, create plugins, develop the platforms, advanced tips, great. Reference. Okay, then you can go off and read it the, all about how does the config XML file work. You can look at that later. What I want to look at is the plugin APIs. We installed those 20 plugins to reach to get access to all of those features. Looking at all of these, let's go look at an easy one for the moment. Find Cordova plugin device. Let's look at the documentation of how does the device plugin or the device API, how does the device code work? Find Cordova plugin device on the left. You're going to see that pretty much everything is going to be set up like this. It's really nicely organized. You're going to see this is all about, again, uh, JavaScript, JavaScript code. It's going to talk about the various objects you can work with, the methods you can work with, the various properties and parameters and arguments that you have. It's fully documented. It's very good. So Cordova plugin device. This plugin defines a global device object which describes the device's hardware and software. Although the object is in the global scope, it is not available until after device ready event. Don't worry about exactly what that means just yet. But basically we have a an object called device. We had document dot something. We had the document object. Document dot get element by ID. We have the console. Console dot log. We have the console object and then the log method. 
Here we have the device uh, object, and it has various then properties and methods and so forth. How to install it, we've already done that. Properties, device.cordova, device.model, these are the things we can look up. These are the things that we can ask the device to provide us. So we can say, okay, show us the version of Cordova that we're currently using in this project. It works on these particular platforms, which is all of them. Um, okay, we can say device.model. Show us the, the name of the device's model or product. The value is set by the device manufacturer and may be different across versions of the same product. It works on all of these platforms. Here's a quick example. So you're always going to see the documentation, what you can do with it, how you can do it. So here's a quick example. Create a variable, call it model, set it to device.model. That's it. Let's try that in our project. Let's, uh, you should have that template copy file. Let's open up your copy of the template. Uh, the WW folder, the scripts folder, because this is JavaScript, scripts folder, and then the index.js, right click, edit with notepad. All of this Cordova code that we're going to write that is JavaScript, we're going to write it in a JavaScript file like index. And so I'll explain in more detail all of this that it, that it says here. It's somewhat self-explanatory. But the big thing that we need to know is there's early on there is a document.addEventListener. We're basically waiting for an event. We've seen something somewhat similar before when we had document.getElementById.onClick. We were waiting for the event of a click. Once we click the button, do something else like run a function. Here we're saying to the document we're adding an event listener of device ready. Once our project, once we do taco run or taco emulate and it runs on a device, eventually it will automatically emit a device ready event. It'll say we're ready. Cordova code is ready to go. Your app is ready. So we're waiting for that event. Device ready. Once that happens, we will launch the, or we will run the onDeviceReady uh, function with some other things here. So then onDeviceReady. Uh, any code that we write basically should be inside of here. Any Cordova specific code should be in the onDeviceReady. So if we're trying to run a Cordova bit of JavaScript, but Cordova JS is not ready, the code will not work. This guarantees that anything we're trying to access Cordova related will work because it waits to run until the device is ready. So anywhere here in the on device ready function, I'll, I'll just add it line 15. Let's make it very obvious here. Alert. We're going to make an alert happen right in our device. And we're going to write device object dot model property. Device dot model. Make a pop up and show the model of the device we're running. Save it. We're no longer going to go up to run in Notepad. It's not a website anymore, it's an app. So what we need to do is, in the command prompt, run this. Now, I had everyone close the command prompt on purpose. I'll show why in a moment. Make sure, then, that on line 15 you have alert <coughs> device.model. I want to open up my command prompt, and there's a quick shortcut to open the command prompt quickly in a particular folder. Instead of going to the Start menu, Launch Command Prompt, CD here, CD there, CD here, we can quickly open a command prompt like this. If you if you're in your Windows Explorer like this, I want to open a command prompt that's inside of the template copy. The quick way to do it is on the keyboard, hold Shift, and then right click 
you get a new option. Open command window here. Without shift, the right click does not show open command prompt here. On the keyboard, first hold shift, then right click your Cordova project, your taco project. Open command window here, and you're there automatically. Instead of having to open command prompt, change to the F drive, CD into the apps, CD into the template. So I'm in my taco project. I've written the proper code. I've saved my files. Let me confirm that. I've saved in Notepad. There we go. All, my index.js file is saved. All I did was I added an, a little alert to pop up the device model. And then in the command prompt, if you've got an emulator, taco emulate Android. I've got a real device, so I'll do taco run Android. Dash dash device. You'll be able to do this class, of course, with a device without a device. Without a device, you have the emulator. Taco emulate Android. I have a real device, so taco run Android. Now let it compile. Subsequent compilations should go faster because not a lot of the code changed. One line of code changed. But because I am running it off a of USB, it is a little slower. Eventually it'll run on my device, and then eventually I'll get a pop-up that will tell me the, 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 the model of this device. It's coming, installing. And so I see something here. My device is running. There's a splash screen. Splash screen finishes. I get a pop-up alert. XT1528. I was expecting Motorola, Moto E, or whatever, but internally the device is this. A simple pop-up that checked what's the device object and its property model. That's what this is saying. Watch this. I'm going to do taco emulate browser or taco run browser. I'm going to load this up on the web browser because I have either an emulator, a device, or browser. Popping up on the browser, splash screen, localhost says Chrome. It alerted that my model is Chrome. If you get a weird broken picture, that's just the splash screen, don't worry. But it loaded up in the browser and it says your model of device is Chrome. So device object has all of these. Device.cordova, device.model, .platform, .unique identifier, .version, .manufacturer. I want to see all of that cool stuff. So, you know, they're saying you can put it inside of a variable and display the variable. Um, just to play with this, we can do this. Device. Um, Maybe just starting from the top. I can do device dot Cordova space plus uh, quotes backslash n. That'll create a new line in the pop up in the alert. Plus device dot model. I'm going to break this into multiple lines because it's going to get long. Do it like this. Plus space quotes backslash. Let me make sure that's a backslash. Plus what's next? Device dot 
you uh, device platform plus new line. The backslash creates a new line in the pop-up plus device dot UUID plus new line plus device.version. We can store all of this in an object and then retrieve it as object properties. Well, there's already the property of device. But uh, here is one of the things that we can do. Manufacturer is virtual and serial. I think those two are new. I don't remember hearing seeing those previously. Thank you. Backslash and oops, version twice. Uh, manufacturer. do is virtual if you want, sure, is virtual. And lastly, device.serial. So you can look up the serial number of a device. What you do with it, I guess we can end it there, what you do with it then depends what your tasks are. So here I will make a pop-up, it's still going to be an alert. First, I'm displaying the Cordova version plus a new line plus the model plus new line plus etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Let me double check it spelled everything right. Device platform UID plus a new backslashes. Save this file. Go back to your <coughs> command prompt and then either emulate it, run it in the browser, or run it in a device. That's our workflow. We had previously write code in Notepad, run in Firefox or Chrome. We're not going to do that anymore. It's not a basic app. It's not a basic website anymore. We now have to either emulate it or run it from the command prompt. It does not automatically update uh, until we rerun it. So I need to cancel this because the last thing I did was my browser. If you don't have the regular command prompt telling you you're on your F drive, you have to cancel. Control C twice. Taco run Android. So eventually, if I type this properly, it will make a pop-up appear. So do my splash screen, then I get a pop-up alert. 4.11. So I'm running Cordova 4.11. The next line, <laughs> XT1528. That's my model number. Next line. I'm on Android because that was the platform. The next is I get my unique identifier, which I won't tell you. And the next line is version of uh, version of Android running on this device. I get 5.1. Next one, I get manufacturer that says Motorola. Next line is virtual, says false. I'm not on a virtual device. Next line, my serial number, which I also will not tell you. So I'm seeing all of these devices properties. Okay, great. That's a nice parlor trick, but what what can you do with this? Does anyone have an idea? What can I do with this stuff? This is a way to write if-else statements. If platform equals iOS, do this. If manufacturer equals that, do something else. Write a switch switch on model, and I have possible models, and do possible different things. This is to help me make decisions. Later on, I'm going to tell you eventually, we're going to add a database to our project. That database doesn't run 
on older devices like Android 2. Even if we set our package in the config XML file where we had Android min SDK, if we lower that all the way down to 8 or 5 or whatever, our app would run on an Android 2.0, but that database cannot run on anything below 4.0, whatever. So we can have some aspects of the device, of the app, run and some not. We can check what device is running. It's too old? Okay, they can have these features, but not these features. So once we're able to check device properties like this, we can make decisions. If statements, switch statements, um, for loops, and that sort of thing. Of course, here this is touchy data, isn't it? This is the exact serial number of a person's device. This is their exact unique identifier, the UUID. So how does that old saying go? With great power comes great responsibility. You're going to be able to look at all of this deep detail of the device. It's up to you to use it properly. And that's why we've asked for this permission. If we never did taco plugin add Cordova dash plugin device, we would not be able to check for these things. That's why when someone is about to download your app, a per it'll say this app requests these permissions to check the device properties. So the documentation goes on to explain how it works, give examples. Sometimes there are quirks. For iOS, trying to do UUID, you need to take some things into account here. If you're on Windows Phone, it does something else, perhaps. So sometimes there will be quirks that you need to pay attention to because they work differently on different platforms. So this one's pretty straightforward. We write a little bit of uh, JavaScript. It gets translated and then it runs on the device as Java and it checks what I've asked for. Let's look at another one here. Let's go to Cordova Plugin Dialogs. This plugin provides access to some native dialog UI elements via a global navigator.notification object. On the left side, it tells you what the methods are. You can do navigator.notification.alert, confirm, prompt, and beep. And then they're listed right there. So, navigator, well, let's jump to beep first the device plays a beep sound. The device is going to play the default error sound, whatever you have on your device. So for the moment, because we're getting close to the end of the day, I will allow you to raise the volume on your devices, so you will be able to then hear your device um, making noise. I'm going to turn this back to normal volume. Okay, the way this works. We have the command, the method, navigator object dot notification dot beep number of times. This is a number. So if I write navigator dot notification dot beep two, it'll beep twice. It'll play a sound twice. On Amazon there's these quirks on Android. Android plays the default notification ringtone specified under the user's setting sound and display. So I don't have a way to say what sound to play. This will play the default error sound. If I want to play a specific sound, that's a different plugin. So this is pretty this one's pretty easy to do. And uh, it'll simply beep if we run that code. Uh, I don't. I don't want that to run. Uh, 
check one thing here. Okay, I don't um, I don't want that to run automatically. I want it to beep if I press a button, let's say. So let's edit our index file to create a button. Then we'll write some JavaScript to make the button active. Once we hit the button, it'll play a, the beep. So edit your index HTML. Line 17, line 18, line 19. Let's make a new line 19. button tag. We don't have jQuery mobile. We don't have jQuery. We have plain old JavaScript. Let's write some plain old JavaScript right here. Uh, we'll just create a button called click me. And we'll add an ID so we can reference it easily through JavaScript. BTN click. Save your index. Then we'll go over to the JS file. We'll write some JavaScript to make that button active. And then we will add that navigator. What is it? Navigator.notification.beep. We'll put in a number there and it'll beep X number of times after we click. So make sure you've given this an ID. BTN click. In our JavaScript, we need to write this inside of the on device ready. Any of these Cordova um, methods need to be on on device ready. Let's say we'll write this line 23. Document.getElement by ID. Which element? BTN click dot on click. On the event of clicking that element equal to the expression function, open close parentheses, open close curly brace, and we should be able to do in the curly braces Navigator.notification dot beep method. And in the parentheses, we give it the argument of how many times to beep. 1, 2, 3, 20, whatever. Don't put 20. Put 3. Save the JS file. Save the HTML file run or emulate in the command prompt and test it out. This will work best on a real device. I think it should work okay on, a, on an emulated device. Let's see. So. I've saved everything. I'm going to go back there. Press up. Remember, you can press up to bring back your last command. Document.getElement by ID. Remember the specific spelling there. The name of the, your ID that you added to your button. Seems to be working. On click. I still have that alert pop up. So I close that. I get then a button right there. Click me. I'll click it. Click it again. Turn my volume up. Three times. 
There we go. That was the default sound I currently have on that device. Just for fun, because I have more than one device at the moment, I'll plug in my other device. So I'm running a different device here. I just swapped them. Same command, same app. Running on a different hardware. I, of course, already set up the drivers for that device. That's why it's working. Compiled in five seconds, so it gets faster every time. It's launching here. So it's launched here. First of all, my alert is telling me, again, I'm running Cordova 4. This is on a Nexus 7, Android, UID, running 6.01, ASUS, false, unique identifier. OK, then I click OK there. I've got a button waiting for me. Three tones. Also, if I rotate, I forgot to mention this, if I rotate, it's locked portrait. Remember we did that a while ago. Without that uh, config preference, this would have rotated. And on a tablet, it might be fine, because I've got a lot of space. On a device like this, rotating might make my app a little small. But I've chosen to lock my app, rectangular, or portrait that is, so doesn't rotate. It's not that I have it locked on my settings, it's that we did it via the config preference. And now we can activate the beep. Right now we did it very obviously, of course. Click here, it beeps. That would be more useful by coupling it with the other dialogues. We have a more advanced alert box. We were doing alert and making a JavaScript alert, which is very basic. Let's look at these other alerts. These alerts are going to look more like a real alert from the device. JavaScript alerts look like a web browser alert. With the Cordova alert, or confirm, or prompt, it will look like an iPhone alert. It will look like an Android alert. It'll look like the proper alert of the device, of the operating system shows a custom alert dialog. Most Cordova implementations use a native dialog box from the device, but some use the browser's alert, which is typically less customizable. This one's more complex. It's the navigator object notification property alert method. We have these. Any of these that are in parentheses, any parameter that is in parentheses is optional. You do need to supply a message, an alert callback function, and an optional title and an optional button name. Using plain old alert will always have a button at the bottom that says OK. My alert can have it say something else like groovy. And the title, instead of it saying alert, can say something else. Those two are optional. Message is a string in quotes. Alert callback. Callback to invoke when alert dialog is dismissed. It's a function which we don't write with parentheses. So this is also very advanced. In addition to clicking the OK button, some other function or functions can be called to have more stuff happen. Optionally, I can add a dialog title at the top, which is a string. If I don't, the default will simply say alert. Optionally, I can rename the button. String optional defaults to OK. So I'm going to copy that line there. I'm going to use it. Yes, I can type it if I memorize it. Or you can copy it because that's fully functional code there. Actually, let's copy... Let's copy the whole little example chunk right here. It's a little bit better. Because um, we have the navigator, we have some possible options for message callback title. It already wrote a callback for us and defined it for us here. So let's copy that little chunk of code. I'm going to say that will happen once... I'm going to repurpose that button. I'm going to say that that button 
will launch this alert. So copy that example code in the, in the alert uh, part of the chapter. Back to our code. I have document, get element, and it's making a beep. Well, I want instead, um, when we click on the button to do the alert, plus the beep. We'll do it like this. New line after the document get element by ID. And I'm going to paste what I copied. I'm going to move the navigator beep. I'm going to cut that or move it into the alert dismissed. My button doesn't do anything yet. They used to beep. I move the beep to the alert dismissed. I'm going to make an alert pop up. Once we close the alert, then it will beep. The alert will happen here, but this needs to be put in a function so that we can call this. I suppose we could put it up there. I feel safer putting it in a function. So uh, up there we will we will call this chunk of code. I'm going to put this code inside of a function. So uh, before the code, I'll write function my alerts. Open close parentheses, open curly brace, and I'm going to close the curly brace after closing the alert method. So it'll get a little tricky here unless you're paying attention. The tab that so you can see it. Define a function my alert, open curly brace, close the curly brace after the parenthesis, which closes alert, but not before I close the curly brace for on device ready. If, to, if you want to, you can customize this, but this will make an alert pop up. The, the title of the alert will say game over. The text of the alert will say, you are the winner. The button itself will say, done. Once I click done, it will run alert dismissed function not with, without the parentheses. That's just the way the, the syntax is set up here. It has to be without parentheses. Launch the alert dismissed function, which is defined right there, which will be. So in order for all of this to work, we need to say we're going to run my alert when the button is clicked in the curly braces of the on click. So the button is still active, it's waiting for a click. Now what will happen is we will run the function my alert. We've just defined my alert. It does all of that. Once you click done on my alert, It'll then run alert dismissed. It'll beep in theory. So go ahead and save it and run it. Test it. That is, uh, run it in taco, of course. Run it on my device. So it ran on my device. That alert is still there. Maybe I should comment it out. Okay, so I've got my device. I've got the same button as before. I click that. I get a pop-up that looks like an Android pop-up, not the web browser pop-up. And at the top it says, game over, like a real pop-up. You are the winner. Great. And then the button says, done, instead of OK. I defined it to what I wanted. I click OK. 
I went over to the alert dismissed callback function where it beeped three times. So we have a nicer alert dialog box. We have also a nicer prompt. We're not going to quite do it at the moment, just telling you in general here, prompt. We're getting to the end of the day, but here's a prompt. We've used prompt as a JavaScript prompt, which asked for you to type your name. Well, with this, we can create a prompt that's a little bit more interesting because it'll display a message for the person with a call back. We can edit the title of that pop-up box and then we've got uh, button labels and default text. What's the text to automatically appear in that dialog box? We didn't have that before. We just had a prompt that said, enter your name. We can put a default text here that will show people what to, what to have there. And then buttons. Uh, button labels. Array of strings specifying buttons. Optional. The defaults are OK and cancel. A prompt automatically has an OK and a cancel. I can make it say something else besides OK and cancel if I list them in an array of strings. That will also be passed into my callback function so it'll, the user will know which button we pressed, one, two, or three. And we can do more with that. Again, we won't do this. You can explore this. The weekend is coming up. This might be something fun to work on. Um, so in this case, the code is there. It makes a pop-up, enter your name. It, it's going to automatically fill in this Jane Doe, which you can change. We have OK and exit buttons. After that, it locks the on prompt uh, met, uh, function, which up here will be do a regular alert which will say, you selected button number. Well, the result object was passed into that function, and then well, which button was pressed, which index was pressed, and so forth. So now that's more complex. It's passing back an object into the callback. And we'll see that more like with the camera and so forth. We're going to end the main lecture at this point. You should have on your flash drive your template project. You're not going to really change much more there. It's your template. Make copies of that to work on new copies of the app. Just making a copy of the folder is good, but you, to, to be a completely different app, you have to edit the config file to change this ID. Technically, it's the same template as before. I'm in the copy of my template, but it's still the same. It's still the same app. It's writing and rewriting the same the same app on my device. If I call this something like my new template, that's a new app. You will have the original template on the device and a new app called <coughs> my new template. So simply changing the ID is a new app, a new folder, and a new ID. Here. And so we'll um, end the main lecture. Um, I'll put a copy of my template into the folder if you want it. Not the one with this stuff here. This is just kind of testing throwaway stuff. Over the weekend, you should look at the Cordova documentation and we'll look at it together, of course. We still have to talk about importing our app. We'll get there eventually. I still want to explore other features of what we can do with Cordova to think about. These are the building blocks. I can do these things. Therefore, I can add these features to my project. I have this great idea to make an app for my company. Well, I have the ability to do vibration, maps, send email, and do cool alerts and all of that. Well, I have the building blocks. I can teach you all the building blocks. I can't quite teach you what app you need to build, but we're going to look at the building blocks. On the side, just for fun, to keep, you know, keep up to date with all of this stuff, I'm playing with the barcode plugin. There's a plugin to access a barcode. 
uh, you can look that up and I've installed the barcode app and what that does is at the moment just because I'm testing it out I'm scanning a bunch of barcodes and seeing all the information encoded into it and then I display it in my app here you know I'm gonna scan this barcode here makes a little beep and it says well this barcode is in code 128 format and these are the, the numbers encoded and so forth so okay I can think about using the barcode plug in on my app to scan my inventory or something and later on when we talk about databases you can save that stuff to a database right now we have plain old variables which are not permanent we have local storage which is more permanent but it has limitation on data size and later on we'll talk about a more powerful database to save even more data so I have all these building blocks of plugins any general questions about what we talked about today Okay, again, if you're having trouble on your own computer, try bringing it. We'll try to troubleshoot your own computer or your own device. Hopefully we can figure it out. I'm going to put my code in the network folder in just a moment, and we'll do lab time until 9.30.